Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share my work. I would like also to salute my colleagues of Isvai for their magnificent presentations. It's indeed a, a, a great to work with this team at Ismai, and also I would like to thank Nuno for his software because live is so much easier now. <laughs> um, yeah, spatial audio just went to another uh, dimension. Um, so thank you, Theo, for uh, inviting this uh, for this uh, interesting uh, festival and symposium. The, the work that I'm, I will be presenting is the work that I made during my PhD at the University of Birmingham during 2010-2016. Uh, I will just to try to share my, my screen. So as I was saying, um, this, this work was, was, um, was part of my PhD um, thesis at the University of Birmingham. And uh, it makes the use of and re reinterpretation of traditional music from the Azores, my homeland, and its integration within the electroacoustic um, field. And also uh, in the case of instrumental music uh, in the contemporary scene. So I, I was, I started as a more traditional composer, and then gradually I went to the dark side and started to use technology. Uh, and now I, my portfolio is mostly based on mixed um, music, instrumental music with electronics and also um, electroacoustic uh, music. So this work frame has been one of my major preoccupations in music composition. As tradition, I mean, tradition, um, traditional um, music from the source can offer a fresh perspective on how to resolve some of the issues that composers deal in a daily basis. As for example, mm -hmm. aesthetics, orchestrations, or even how sound or uh, tradition, uh, like uh, some, uh, some acti traditional activities can inform you to compose something um, hopefully new. Uh, so, um, I was also very interesting, uh, interested in exploring the traditional elements from my homeland because at the time there was little or few references on, on how to integrate uh, this material within the contemporary art music. Most people knew about uh, Azorian Francisco Cerda, that was a Portuguese composer that uh, was in contact with Debussy. Uh, he had a major activity on um, uh, conducting French uh, orchestras, but besides that, there are few references on how to treat this material. With uh, almost a century of distance since Lacerda experimented with this kind of uh, sources, I asked myself why composers were not dealing with this. Were they haunted by nationalistic cliches or the material was not uh, interesting enough? And probably it was neither of these questions because um, some composers from the mainland were using um, traditional music to compose. Uh, but this material was always uh, material from the mainland. So I believe that because of its geographical uh, location, the culture of the Azores was historically uh, unknown. But now with the internet, it has facilitated the access to documentation, to uh, to its uh, to its cultural activities from from all the islands. So for those who are not very familiar with the Azores, um, the the its location is about one thousand six hundred and twenty two kilometers from Lisbon. Um, so I'm not a religious composer. Uh, my portfolio is it's not mainly represented by sacred music, but. Um, this piece that is called Ad Eternum uh, was um, not thought or considered to be sacred music, but uh, it, it um, uses sacred chants from there. And it tries to create a dramatic experience or what could be perceived as a ceremonial one. So during my research about culture and the characteristics of the Azores, I couldn't ignore the fact that the Azorean culture was heavily um, uh, religious. So besides the Vatican celebration and Christian main calendar, we have our own cults 
uh, with its own calendar. And uh, one of the most expressive religious activities on San Miguel Island is the men's pilgrimage around the island before Easter. And they spend one week walking, chanting and praying. So Ad Eternum was composed thinking on this physical and psychological demanding um, experience and what makes one to do it. So it is a metaphor for the longing uh, struggle between the human experience and its desire for the divine or some sense of peacefulness. This piece integrates a major group of pieces that have the same concept, the, the exploration of traditional elements, uh, especially with, with voices, and have the same title that is uh, Insayu Subkant, we can translate it as Issei on Chance. And the main goal is to explore the multiple possibilities with uh, traditional sound sources. I use three chants, uh, ceremonial songs from, from a recording that was made in the 1960s by Professor Artur Sanch. It is called the Folk Music of the Azores Sound Anthology. As the main basis for the creation of this dramatic uh, um, work, I try to explore um, by uh, deconstructing, reintegrating these sources into the context of uh, acousmatic uh, music. There are two main sounds that I use in this piece, the bells and voices that were the focus of multiple transformations resulting in a combination of electronic and concrete sounds that were brought together as a way of linking these two elements. I said before that the, the voices were going to be part of this work cycle, but uh, why using bells as another um, uh, structural sound source and why using recordings from the 60s when the sound quality was not, was not ideal back then? So my main reason uh, for selecting this type um, specific sound sources was a personal wish to use the most ancient documentation available with minimal exposure to external influences. Nowadays, these chants are becoming almost extinct and rituals are becoming different with external influences. Also, one of the selected chants uh, has an introduction with bells, so I use it as a structural sound source uh, in my work. These three ritual songs are titled Lembrança das Almas, so I'll just put it again here. You can translate it as Remem Remembrance of Souls. Final do Terço, uh, Final Chaplet, and Paixão, Passion. Um, Ad Eternum is the longest piece in this portfolio and perhaps the most difficult um, I composed at the time because of its large duration, 17 minutes, and limited uh, material that I later developed it. So I would like to give you uh, small examples of the original sound sources. So the first one, the first chant that I use in the piece. Baby. Sorry, uh, were you all able to listen it? Beautiful, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Yes. so the, the second um, chant. So, okay, I have these three um, chants that I'm going to, to develop throughout the piece. Um, and having already so many electroacoustic pieces that reference bells and voices, starting by iconic Gesanga der Jülinge by Stockhausen and also Jonathan Harvey's Mortus Plango Vivos Volko, what could I be that would be substantial? 
Uh, so the construction of a dramatic timeline was definitely important to give sense to these uh, materials. From Harvey's and Stockhausen pieces, I learned the relationship that these composers developed between the voices and the bell sound. Furthermore, the, in the case of Harvey's work with spectral techniques, which I frequently use in my work as a composer, I am also uh, fascinated by this kind of smooth transitions between sound, and it has become one of my main resources in most of my pieces. Harvey used many technological resources to analyze and shape the bell sound and voices. For example, the passages of the boy's voice are shaped in a bell-like envelope and vowels. Spectra transformed to be near to the bell spectrum. What I came to understand about these procedures is that Harvey and Schockhausen were creating a way of linking distinct sonic events as a way of normalizing them in a musical discourse. So bringing a collection of events into narrative coherence can be described as a way of normalizing those events. It renders them plausible, allowing one to see how they all belong. Some of the techniques were partly developed in Ad Eterno, uh, some of these spectral techniques that Harvey's, uh, uh, Har Jonathan Harvey was using, um, as an attempt to discover how to bring my own material into the acousmatic context in linking the sounds. For example, the voices were processed to link with electronic sounds by using subtractive, uh, subtractive synth and gradually filtering the voices into sine waves by using Durham evolution tool, and later could link it to bell sounds that were also filtered and shaped to sine waves. Other procedures differ from Arvis methods, uh, especially regarding form and harmonic organization, which did not follow a, sp a spectral relationship. So I would like to show you how uh, after processing the material, so in this, the first case, I have the, the bell uh, in which I took out the, 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 date, the spectrum data from, from the beginning, the introduction of the first jump. Uh, and then I wanted to have this kind of uh, frozen uh, bell spectrum, but in a way that I could um, control the dynamic level of, of each uh, partial. So this is uh, one of the, um, the transformed uh, sounds. So moving on to uh, one of the, the, um, the filtered voices after also um, processing it at, you know, on the GRM tools. Okay, so, um, and then we can hear a little bit of the beginning of the piece that um, uh, fusions these this two, this two um, parts, the, the original sound source and then the processed uh, sound.
So um, the, the beginning is a, a gradual construction of how I can go from, from process sound to the original sound source. So I explored the material with several several processes with different tools, such as GRM tools, as mentioned before, the BIST tools for uh, specialization of the sound, audio sculpt for the um, to analyze the, the, the sounds, and some spectral plugins developed by Michael Norris. Um, such deep and sorrowful singing uh, inspired me to a metaphorical attribution of the sound material. So bells were thought to represent the divine and the voices, the human condition. Uh, therefore, the musical discourse was arranged to bear this confrontation in mind. The first material explored was the bell. The sound is omnipresent and has two functions. Firstly, to support the development of musical discourse carried by the voices, and secondly, to disturb it. I generated a sustained and stable uh, bell sound for the first function, and for the, the latter created several versions of the original uh, envelope, which could portray a sharp and aggressive sound. Um, so for, the, um, for the, 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 the frozen spectrum of the bell, I, I also did an additional um, process, which was the additive uh, synthesis. Uh, was made on Max MSP, so I created the sound, uh, I created everything there. And I also used um, another patch that was controlling the individual gain of each, of each um, sine wave. So this uh, enabled me to obtain a more clean sound without the background noise that was present in the original source. The spectrum sounded very close to the original and, and, and also a more organic sound. So this is an image of the patch with different uh, sine waves and also being controlled individually. About the form, the form can be divided in a simple ABA and to structure the long term, the time, uh, time span discourse, I use the golden ratio to organize the structural points of the piece. After devising the general plan, I started arranging the events to meet the structural points. A few adjustments to the timeline were made during the compositional process. These adjustments derived from the oral percep perception and reaction to the, to the space where I was in, so the, I was working on the Beast Studios, um, where um, additional points were needed to convey a smoother musical discourse. So section A is occupied mostly by the first chant, the chant developed in many ways. Um, and the second chant is delivered by a solo male voice, almost in a repetitive, uh, uh, recitative style, alter, alternating with women response. So this creates a, a very uh, contrast uh, to the previous chant and helping to push also the discourse towards the second climax of, uh, climax of the piece. After section B, more calm and contemplative section, um, the last A is presented where the third chant is introduced and using the same stylization techniques and as in section A. So this last chant is a harmonic shift to a major mode, create, creating a sensation of relief towards the end of the piece, although the final bell is bringing again a more tension uh, sensation to the piece. Complementary sources are, uh, were added to create an additional environment and sound novelty. For example, aeolian sounds and also a church bell soundscape. The final section functions as a coda, combining events from all sections. The specialization options turn out to suggest an, uh, an imaginary uh, church and its surroundings. I tried to keep the original sources more focused in the front with the synthesized version of the sine wave sound spread through all the channels as an extension of the main source. This could also be linked to the idea of a listener that is facing the altar with uh, most sounds having their or origin there. So Aditernin brings a collection of ceremonial chants to the electroacoustic context, exploring and keeping these chants alive as a way of preserving a culture's memory. So I'm finishing my presentation. I, I want to thank you once more for your time, and I hope that you can listen, listen to the closing concert at 7 p.m. and to hear this piece with the 
multi-channel piece and as well my colleague Rui Peña's work. So thank you very much for listening to me. Angela, thank you. Uh, once again, standing ovation here from Cape Town, um, a small but very um, inspired crowd that you have here. That's, that's magnificent work. Thank you so much. Um, may I pose one or two questions, please? The first three sound examples that you played, the source material, um, could you sketch the conditions under which they were recorded? Was it part of a church, of, of a religious ceremony, uh, church service, etc.? Yes, it, it was, I mean, this, all of these recordings were made, sorry, I'm having technical issues here. Um, so <laughs> all of these recordings were made in loco um, by, by Professor Artur Santos. So um, he was catching everyone uh, during this, this time of the year uh, that uh, they have to do this kind of uh, ceremonies in specific um, days. Mm. So uh, the first one is, I mean, the, the, the three chants are made in, in November. For the first of no November, that is the death of the, um, the day of the dead. Uh, so they are kind of very heavy songs because they, they, they represent the, the, the will of, of something that is it's um, not possible to achieve. So you're praying for, for your loved ones and you also hope that they are okay, whatever they are. Uh, so these are really, really um, strong uh, emotional songs. And of course, this working on this material was very, also very emotional to me because um, it brought some memories of my of my homeland, and yeah. working on this is it was kind of a, a cartasis. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, may I continue with two short, more, more short questions, please? Um, so we have the source material, the original recordings, and then in the graphic analysis that you showed a slide of at seven minutes twenty six, there is a, a little remark heavily processed, so samples heavily processed at 726. Um, I'm curious exactly what, what processes that you, that, you, that you execute, you know, with the source material. Yeah, so the, the, the bell, this is a, a section where um, you will hear um, a lot of, of, of bells um, that are transformed through multiple uh, processes, through transposition, through distortion, through reverse. So some basic techniques, others I use some, some distortion to, to create this more aggressive or um, disruptive sound. Yeah. So it also helps when you have a massive distribution um, through the speakers. So this kind of, of uh, immersive and also very loud um, sound coming from all directions. It helps to create this kind of climax and, and uh, central point in, in the piece. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, you. let's see if from our audience members, no questions from this side. Uh, last question from my side. Uh, the rendering of the work or the, the the final composition st stage took place at Beast. So is this a um, site-specific work? Can you only listen to it in their uh, playback setup or is it transportable? Can it be performed in other venues or easily performed in other venues? Yes. Um, well, I was working in the in the Beast studio. So the, 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 the studio had, uh, had already um, a national um, configuration. And of course, exactly for for the piece to be able to be transposed to another uh, concert hall, I, I worked in a very simple um, setup. So the premiere was made in Beast Dome. That um, it's another um, room where they have like a 
partially uh, insulated um, sound system. So it's kind of a ad hoc, let's say, yeah. um, setup. Uh, and it actually worked very, very well because the space was uh, relatively small. It, it wasn't like the, the Brannan Hall that it's uh, bigger. Uh, and, and it almost felt like you were all really in the, in the church. So, so, so yeah, if, if it were to be transposed to another place, I would have to, to deal with perhaps equalization and reverb settings to, yeah. to be more, uh, close to the original, uh, space that I was thinking about. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, no worries. Thank you very much for your uh, questions. And um, well, thank you. <laughs>